The United States, as we reported yesterday on the show, continues to block aid efforts into Gaza. Meanwhile, the UN's uh, relief agency that operates in the besieged enclave says that the people feel abandoned and shunned and alienated. UN aid efforts are also on the verge of collapse uh, in Gaza and Israeli occupation forces have intensified suppression in both East Jerusalem as well as the West Bank. Uh, we talked to Abdul and asked him what Friday was like in the occupied territories. Ford, which is among the biggest uh, automakers in the United States, has capitulated and reached a historic tentative agreement with the United Auto Workers Union that represents 57,000 of its employees. They are set to win uh, bigger raises than they have in the past two decades or more. Uh, does this right the wrongs done to workers in the past uh, and set the tone for US labor movements in other sectors as well? And uh, our last bit today is on the ICC Cricket World Cup which is ongoing in India. The tournament is at its halfway point. Uh, and the sport has received the good news while the tournament has been going on uh, at the, uh, after the IOC session held in Mumbai, that it will be included in the Olympic program for the Summer Games in Los Angeles 2028. Is this the logical next step in the process of making cricket more global? Or is the International Olympic Committee just chasing cricket dollars? Salams, you're watching Daily Debrief coming to you, as always, from People's Dispatch. I'm Sizan Thani, and before we go any further, I ask you to take a second and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, Gaza is being strangled, says uh, Philippe Lazzarini, who is the chief of the United Nations uh, Relief uh, Refugee Agency for Palestinians. Uh, he also said that the people of Gaza feel shunned, alienated and alone at this time. They're receiving very little help. The United States, as we were mentioning earlier, continuing to block uh, the kind of aid efforts that are required to meet the basic needs of the two million plus people that live uh, on the Gaza Strip. Uh, meanwhile, reports also coming in that the United States has hit targets in Syria. The US, of course, has said that these are unrelated to what is going on in Israel, uh, as well as in the Gaza Strip and uh, the uh, occupied territories. But is anything unrelated uh, at all, uh, Abdul, at this point? Uh, how does this figure, Abdul, if we can uh, start maybe uh, with that part, or, or actually maybe we can start uh, given that it's Friday and we're seeing uh, increased sort of suppression by Israeli security forces, by occupation forces in both occupied East Jerusalem as well as the West Bank, uh, what were scenes like uh, at uh, Aqsa Mosque uh, where, you know, normally on a Friday perhaps tens of thousands would gather for prayers and uh, social uh, activities? Well, uh, ev everything is connected uh, to just to kind of refer to what uh, you were uh, mentioning about in the beginning of your uh, interaction. Um, mm -hmm. And as far as uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque is concerned, uh, remember that, uh, as you rightly pointed out, this is Friday. Every Friday, thousands of people, thousands of Palestinians gather uh, to offer their uh, weekly prayer uh, at the mosque. Uh, but th this time, Israelis uh, kind of tried to prevent uh, people from gathering there. Uh, the reasons are, of course, obvious. One is the uh, that we have also discussed so many times on this show in the past, that how any large gathering, uh, particularly when there is a war going on uh, in Gaza, kind of becomes an, uh, kind of, uh, kind of, uh, an issue for the occupation, uh, uh, Israeli occupation. And, and uh, this large gathering on Friday was, uh, of course, one of those gatherings, which, of course, uh, it was expected that post the prayers, there will be a solidarity protest. There could be a solidarity protest uh, in favor of uh, the people in Gaza. And Israel wanted to prevent that. Uh, 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 it And that's why its forces basically uh, uh, did whatever they could do except for the firing uh, uh, live bullets they tried everything they uh, basically they 
if I had, uh, uh, you can say, basically tear gas and so on, uh, tried to kind of prevent forcefully uh, these people who were kind of trying to go and pray. Uh, that is one. Uh, the, what was happening in East Jerusalem is one. If you see the larger West Bank, uh, I think we have also uh, discussed that on, on this show before. But you see, Jenin, in Jenin, uh, more than four people were killed. Uh, and uh, there are reports that Israeli forces were basically trying to uh, uh, kind of cut the communication lines, which basically uh, uh, kind of uh, there was uh, basically joints uh, that uh, Jenin refugee camps where thousands of Palestinians live with the rest of the West Bank. And they have basically kind of surrounded it with forces and they have also uh, 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 kind of destroyed the road, the only road which connects it with the rest of the West Bank. There are also reports of, uh, of course, arrests and shootings in different parts of the occupied West Bank. So if you see, uh, the war is not going on on just one front in Gaza. Uh, the, uh, the ent all the Palestinian uh, occupied territories, whether it is East Jerusalem or it is uh, uh, the occupied West Bank, the Israeli forces are trying to uh, kind of uh, uh, oppressed Palestinians in whatever way possible, kind of, uh, they don't want the uh, Palestinians in occupied uh, West Bank and East Jerusalem to kind of even show sol solidarity to their fellow uh, 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 people in uh, uh, Gaza. And that's what uh, uh, basically explains the, uh, the kind of uh, operation which the uh, people in uh, East Jerusalem are going through. Right. Uh, and, and we'll get, get to those uh... U.S. strikes now, uh, Abdul, uh, targeting, uh, coming also along with uh, new sanctions. Uh, wh what are the details on those strikes? And, and, and as you were saying, nothing is unrelated. Uh, tie the sort of threads together for us, please. Well, ever since the, uh, uh, the war began on October 7, uh, it, U.S. has been trying to kind of uh, prevent the war to become much more reasonable and despite their attempts it has it is not possible to restrict uh, kind of uh, to constrain the war within the palestinian territories and uh, we have seen how uh, the hezbollah has been basically uh, trying basically uh, clashing with the israeli forces israel was forced to remove thousands of its, uh, settlers from the northern uh, its northern parts Primarily because his, uh, there was a, a, there is a, a kind of viable threat from Hezbollah. Then there there are reports of how uh, Houthis from Yemen are also uh, kind of gradually uh, uh, trying to kind of uh, make some interventions. Then there are reports from uh, uh, Israeli base uh, uh, observation uh, base in Eritrea being attacked. One of the soldiers uh, uh, was was killed yesterday uh, on uh, on um, thursday then there are also uh, reports of uh, of course uh, uh, attack on the us basis all across the region uh, primarily the, these the attacks have increased in recent days ever since the war began uh, uh, and the main reason cited by uh, the groups who basically uh, claimed uh, that they, they they were behind the attack is that that the way us is uh, supporting the israel's war effort in israel's genocide and ethnic cleansing in uh, in the in gaza is basically is a primary uh, you can say uh, uh, reason for them to kind of target uh, the us basis so uh, according to the us own claim around uh, 19 attacks have been reported ever since uh, 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 the beginning of this month and most of these attacks have happened in the recent time, means ever since the war has begun. And they they, they can see that there is a growing uh, 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 kind of mobilization against the US assets all across the region. There were similar attacks in Iraq. There are, uh, 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 and, and by the way, one should remember that the number of US assets in the region has uh, have also increased in the last few days, apart from the U.S. warship, which was deployed in the initial days, now U.S. has also deployed more troops uh, and more warships in the region. So it seems that the, there are, and, and all of this is related to the war in, in, in Gaza. Uh, the U.S. want, as I said before, U.S. wants to kind of uh, threaten all these regional players. Uh, the states have not been uh, uh, proactive uh, 
uh, when it comes to kind of putting physical threats to uh, Israeli and US uh, uh, interest in the region. But the the what we call the non-state actors or the groups, mm. popular groups, the resistant groups have been very vocal and very active. So in, in the US tr is trying to put a quote unquote deterrent against all these uh, uh, groups. And that's why the number of assets uh, is, uh, is increasing. And that basically puts US in much more vulnerable position. And that, bas uh, and that is the reason that the, the, uh, the, the two military bases in Syria were targeted uh, uh, on Thursday. Uh, 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 and the US claim that this is unrelated is basically a bogus claim. It has no basis uh, on the ground uh, and everyone can see it. Uh, if you see, if you just to kind of conclude that, um, mm. <clears throat> what uh, Austin claimed, the US uh, uh, Secretary of Defense claimed that um, these uh, attacks were unrelated. Uh, if you just see what is happening in the UN uh, General Assembly at this moment, uh, there is a debate going on. And in during that debate on the first day, uh, on Thursday, Israeli Foreign Minister quite obviously said, which was similar things were reputed by the other speakers who came after him, uh, that if US is uh, uh, backing Israeli genocide in Gaza, and if US continues to do that, there is no way it can escape the uh, repercussions related to it, and it will face uh, those repercussions. So if you just see uh, everything in that context, it becomes quite obvious that uh, US claims does not have any rational basis. It's just a PR attempt to kind of justify uh, that this is independent to what is happening in Israel, uh, sorry, in Gaza, and that has no other uh, 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 no other uh, aspects attached to it. But but of course that nobody is buying, of course. Yeah, uh, but but they 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 are still selling, and and and, and uh, as you are pointing out rightly, Abdul, it just creates a cycle, you know, the, of increasing assets, uh, therefore increasing vulnerability. Exactly. Um, and increasing resistance as long as they continue uh, to hold this stance of not allowing even uh, basic aid uh, in and, and demanding or imposing, like we were talking about yesterday, uh, an internationally mandated ceasefire in Gaza as soon as possible to end the kind of horror that we've been witnessing uh, and the people of Gaza, Palestinians living in Gaza, have been living through uh, since the 7th of October. Thanks very much, Abdul, for your time today. Uh, we move on to our uh, next story on uh, debrief, which is which is a, a big one. We, we've of course covered uh, the the UAW United Auto Workers uh, strike on the 25th of October. Uh, the leaders of uh, the union announced that Ford, which is uh, among the three biggest uh, auto manufacturers in the United States, has capitulated. There is now a tentative agreement in place between the union. Uh, and and the manufacturer the, between the and the company, uh, fifty seven thousand Ford employees will benefit from what is uh, the biggest hike uh, in twenty two years. So so a massive win there for workers for unions. Um, Anish uh, is uh, looking at this story. Uh, Anish, the the agreement uh, provides among other things, and I'm sure you'll get into the details for us. 25% increase in, in base wages uh, going through to April 2028. So it's it's a massive win and, and it comes uh, along with uh, other demands also being fulfilled, including uh, better retirement benefits and the right to strike uh, when maybe future plant closures are planned and, you know, for workers to oppose those kind of management decisions. Take us through some of the more important details. Well, let's begin with uh, the wage hike itself. It's quite a historic one. Uh, it hasn't happened in decades. This is one of the largest victories that they have uh, come up with. Uh, because apart from uh, you know the base wages, uh, base uh, hike of 25%, we're also seeing a cost of living adjustment system mechanism that used to exist earlier, uh, but was uh, withdrawn uh, in the previous contract term. Uh, primarily because, uh, you know, companies like uh, Ford, uh, GM and Stellantis were actually going through a certain kind of laws and workers pretty much uh, sacrificed uh, cost of living adjustments 
uh, much to their own, you know, uh, at, at the expense of their own wages uh, being completely stagnated uh, and real wages declining uh, over the next few years. Uh, so this return of the cost of living adjustments is actually going to bring up uh, the base wage uh, hike to about around 33% or to 35%. Uh, that is what the union leadership is uh, calculated. And that would be a significant uh, increase over the next five years. Uh, apart from that, we are also looking at uh, an immediate wage hike of 11% at the very minimum for you know people who are not contract workers. For contract workers, there's a different kind of, uh, uh, you know, wage hikes and benefits that are being announced. Uh, we are looking at about a 150% increase uh, for contract workers over the next, uh, th for the next uh, contract tenure. And uh, on top of that, there's an 85% immediate increase in their wages. Now, contract workers are the lowest, uh, the least paid uh, group of workers, class of workers within these automobile sector. Uh, they do not have any kind of retirement benefits or medical benefits. And so they're, uh, you know, acquiring this kind of uh, massive hikes uh, for them is also a major victory and clearly shows that the union has not left anybody behind. You were also seeing, uh, you know, major uh, uh, you know, obviously, apart from the cost of living adjustments, you're also seeing major uh, return of, uh, you know, sort of arrangements that existed for pensions, uh, for uh, retirement benefits, and for medical care. And that, uh, where, you know, the employer's contributions will also go up uh, over the next uh, couple of years, and that is going to actually benefit a lot of workers. Now, this is obviously... Uh, there is there are there are arguments about how this might uh, you know how much this can actually uh, help workers considering that uh, inflation and you know the cost of living crisis that has unfolded over the past two years was two two or three years uh, because of the pandemic uh, pretty much actually uh, re uh, brought down real wages in on uh, you know several areas especially for uh, you know people who do not, who work in contracts. So, uh, but nevertheless, this historic, uh, uh, you know, settlement that uh, might actually create a sort of precedent for also for uh, workers in Ford and Stellantis, sorry, for General Motors and Stellantis. And that can actually benefit about uh, close to 150,000 workers automobile in the automobile sector in the United States. And this obviously uh, shows obviously also shows that uh, strikes work and you know labor mobilization labor militancy has worked and this is pretty much a very good example of that success absolutely and you led us very nicely into the, the that second part of our conversation today anish which is the kind of impact that this will have not just uh, on the other workers of course at uh, gm and celantis who are also striking uh, but we've seen uh, massive labor mobilizations across sectors in the United States uh, for some time now. Uh, what are they likely to gain from uh, this victory? And how is it, uh, in, in what way will it sort of add or reinvigorate uh, the, the struggle for, uh, you know, workers' rights, better wages, uh, decent working conditions, all of the things that we've talked about on the show before? Well, it's going to be an interesting uh, thing to watch because obviously this uh, Ford agreement is coming after 40 days of, uh, you know, this progressive strike that has been there. Um, and that is definitely going to uh, have its own impact and in the negotiations that we are going to see in, uh, uh, in Stellantis and in General Motors. Uh, we need to. We can expect that there will be more or less similar or same terms uh, hopefully, uh, for the rest of the workers uh, within the automobile industry. And that can act actually, uh, this is also definitely not coming at a time when the industry is going through a bad phase. The industry has made billions in profits uh, over the last few years, especially during the pandemic. And obviously, it is time for them to share the uh, part of that uh, to the workers as well. But uh, the question definitely comes is how far. Uh, this can go, uh, how much it will affect other industries, um, which, uh, you know, still have different kinds of uh, contracts 
We have, re- but we have recently seen how labor mobilizations across sectors have, you know, played wonders in many ways uh, in actually uh, giving workers some very crucial historic protections. Uh, we have recently talked about uh, the writers' strike in Hollywood uh, and how uh, you know they secured a major uh, victory of their own. We have also recently spoken about uh, you know labor mobilization in retail sector in uh you know fast food chains uh, yeah. Uh, yeah and uh, and this is definitely going to make uh like this is a definitely a very new era where you're actually uh, seeing a return of labor mobilization uh in a country which among the oecd uh nations has one of the poorest uh, labor unionization rates uh is known for uh you know very uh, uh you know restrictive labor uh uh labor laws or union laws that actually restrict mm. a lot of mobilization in itself from the get go even refu- allow uh, you know putting up obstacles in forming unions so that clearly shows uh, that this labor mobilization making such major strides is going to definitely affect how people view uh, labor unions now it's a very different era it is far it is far away from the kind of uh, demonization that we used to see against unions uh so definitely this is going to uh, mark a different period and obviously automobile sector was one of the places where labor mobilizations were massive uh, and um, you know entered massively into the us uh, political system uh this is going to be no different the current set of strikes and the kind of victories that they're going to make uh in the coming days all right thank you very much uh, anish for uh, giving us the lowdown on that a massive victory for the united auto workers union and as you pointed out uh, for the larger uh, labor movement and and all unions across sectors uh, particularly in the united states uh, our final bit for today uh, is from the icc cricket world cup which as i mentioned is uh, ongoing in india now if you follow the sport of cricket uh, you will already know that india is has emerged or has turned into the global uh, driving force uh, for this sport uh, particularly from a monetary or a financial aspect uh, most of the television revenue advertising revenue interest comes from either india or the wider indian subcontinent uh, so it was uh, kind of interesting that two major things happened in the sport of cricket back to back first it was uh, afghanistan uh, the afghanistan men's cricket team that beat uh the reigning world champions england uh, at the world cup that was a massive shock uh the other was uh, a development that impacts the sport at a macro level uh which is uh, at the ioc session held in mumbai which we reported on earlier uh, on daily debrief uh, cricket was included in the program for the summer games los angeles 2028 uh, players across the board including some of the best players in the world are uh, talking about how they are excited to be pa- olympians and, and you know part of uh, what is uh, i suppose the biggest spectacle in global sport uh, but we be asking sharda ugra is joining us we'll go across to her um, sharda i want to ask you first though in the context of the world cup uh, because it's being hosted in india because pakistan are participating because it's uh, you know just ahead of a general election and nothing uh gathers interest as much as cricket does uh, when it comes to india uh so is it all political um absolutely uh, siddhant you know what's happened in this world cup is that india are the host nation uh, we have fed through the team has performed very very strongly but the entire manner in which it was organized uh with regard to say particularly the pakistani players their visas were delayed which technically never happens if 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 there's an all clear from uh, governments uh, to to have pakistani cricketers come it's everything is very smooth this time the visas are delayed uh, their media had time getting had, had pro- difficulty getting visas for accreditation uh, and the, and literally there's been hostility in the crowd as well so this whole thing about the world cup being without the world was a, was an uh, was a headline that uh, uh, in an article in uh, the melbourne age and uh, that is true because it's almost like it's india celebrating its cricket where there are ways to celebrate it but the world is here so you need to celebrate the game more than just your specific identity of your great indianness that is re- but regardless of that what has happened is that the indian team has done exceptionally well in this tournament they are, they are they are looking like the strongest team 
Uh, we are halfway through five matches out of the nine that they'll have to play before the knockouts. And they've won all five. They're the only team that have won all five. So it's a very interesting tournament because everyone else is there trying to compete for the big prize. This is the biggest prize in world cricket. Um, but it's almost like uh, the, the sort of nationalist project of the Indian government seems to be as much a part of it as uh, the Indian team's uh, performance. It's almost, it's alongside it. There were stories about uh, the Indians uh, maybe playing in an all saffron uniform against Pakistan. So saffron, the saffron of India versus the green of Pakistan is also a parallel sort of religious uh, uh, kind of symbolism that was there. You've had all these things uh, going on. Right. And, and, and if we can talk about the second major development, uh, Sharda cricket at the Olympics, uh, is this sort of uh, the, the next step in making it a truly global sport? Or is it more about the, the marketing people and the suits at the International Olympic Committee uh, wanting to sort of get a cut of uh, cricket's money pie? I think the, the revenue and the eyeballs are very important in this entire argument in terms of its popularity. Now, everybody tells you that cricket is not a global game. Only few countries play it. Only 10 countries play it at the highest level, which is absolutely true. Uh, but... Uh, what we have to remember that in terms of the most uh, of the highest media rights value for sort of nation versus na nation versus nation competition, so which is like world championships in any sport. Uh, number one is possibly the FIFA World Cup. Number two is the are the Olympic Games, and number three is the Cricket World Cup. Now that is a huge, that's a massive uh, uh, number in terms of the what the media rights value is, which is possibly one interest. Uh, for the IOC because they're saying what brings this media rights value? It's probably the Indian subcontinent, the population and the and the passion that they have for cricket. So that's the IOC side of the uh, of the picture in terms of what it looks like. And it's a very young population in, in, in this region as well. Um, and also the format, which is 2020 cricket, is the one that is the most easily marketable elsewhere. So I think, uh, you know, viewers say in, in, in parts of the world where cricket is not a, uh, is not a game in their, in their sport at top of the mind, they'll be surprised to know that, for example, Thailand, uh, Thailand's women, Th Thailand women uh, are very good, uh, have a very good women's team. Uh, Brazil have a very good women's team. Uh, Papua New Guinea play uh, men's cricket as well. So you're getting all these combinations and, and, and permutations working into this format. And I think in, in say, in parts of Africa as well, uh, they're trying to have the African Nations Cup and bring people into cricket. And um, the Olympics will both then spread the money that comes from Olympic participation all the way down the line and help the cricket sort of globalization project. And in that context, this 2020, which is a three and a half hour short format of the game, is the best way. It's very exciting. It's very fast. And um, whatever we old people may think about the format, it's really easily communicable, which a lot of cricket tends not to be sometimes quite complicated to both to teach and to learn. But 2020 works for everybody. And, and let's see how it does in uh, Los Angeles, because you'll see you'll be seeing the top six teams of the world competing and you'll see really, really high quality cricket. All right. Thanks very much, Shaza. Uh, pretty interesting uh, how I think uh, cricket, uh, particularly in terms of how it's run around the world, uh, will deal with this Olympic question. But we'll get to that uh, somewhere later. For now, that's all we have on this episode of Daily Debrief. Uh, from Sharda, myself, everyone on the show and the entire team at People's Dispatch, uh, thank you very much for watching. You can, of course, get details on all of these stories uh, at our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Uh, we'll be back for a week-ending show uh, tomorrow. Until then, stay safe. Goodbye.